right, let's get started. So today we're going to continue our discussion of isolation plans. And today we have a pretty different paper describing a different way of isolating code running on a computer system. And in this case, it's WebAssembly, uh, the paper. It's an example of an approach to isolation called software fault isolation, which we're going to look at in this lecture. And it has some interesting properties worth understanding. And it's also a cool system in its own right. It's pretty widely used, good to know about. So what are these guys trying to achieve? So in the paper, these guys really want to provide a way to run high-performance code in a web browser. So uh, what they're worried about is being able to run code that is both fast in the browser and portable, meaning that should run on different architectures and should be able to run code from different languages, and of course should be safe. So the baseline for running code in the browser, we haven't talked about this, we'll talk about web browsers and web security much more after spring break, but I'm sure you guys have seen, roughly speaking, that in a browser you can run JavaScript code from different websites. So this is JavaScript code from some site A, and you might have code, JavaScript code from another site B, and they're all running inside the browser on top of the JavaScript engine, very coarsely speaking. And the JavaScript engine is responsible for running these two pieces of code in your browser isolated from one another. So if you're visiting two different sites, they can't monkey with each other's state. That seems like a really important pro property. And just for, just to sort of get our bearings, right, so JavaScript does provide this isolation property, the safety that WebAssembly, of course, thinks is important. But by the standards of this paper, they're thinking JavaScript is too slow for their goal. And it's kind of single language, meaning that if I want to write a piece of code in C or Rust or Go or Haskell or pick your favorite language, it's going to be kind of clunky trying to get it into the browser. You'll have to compile from your language into JavaScript, which is a weird compilation target. People have done this, but it's clunky and slow. But at least it is safe and widely available. So that's sort of the baseline set up here. You might also try to understand what else could we do. So what about other languages? Like, well, C, you know, it's sort of the prototypical, like, you know, of course there's C. Uh, not, not particularly maybe safe. But there's other better languages like Rust that try to provide better type safety or Go or lots of fancy modern languages. So they're pretty fast. One downside to one of these existing fancy languages is that it is by construction language specific. So if we somehow decide that, I don't know, Go or Rust or C was the thing that you could embed in a browser instead of JavaScript, well, we'd be stuck with that language now instead of any other language. So if I chose Rust, well, the Go programmers would be stuck. They wouldn't be able to run their code in the browser. So it's sort of single language as well. So it's, yeah, not multi-language either or not in a convenient way. And maybe somewhat surprisingly, even the safe languages like Rust are actually unsafe in the sense that the browser cares about. So Rust is sort of safe in the sense that it makes it difficult for you to corrupt memory and have buffer overflow problems like the things you saw in labs. But Rust doesn't have this threat model where they're thinking, the programmer is malicious. I can't let the programmer write any bad code at all. That is not Rust's goal. Rust lets you import arbitrary code. Let, Rust lets you read and write arbitrary files. You can have unsafe blocks in, in code of all these supposedly safe languages. So these languages aren't really targeting the programmer as the untrusted boundary. These languages themselves aren't really a good fit for what the WebAssembly guys are going for. And similarly, you know, x86, you know, trying to push down the stack, is another option. And actually, the WebAssembly paper, if you uh, read it, talks a lot about native client as a previous system that actually Google developed. And it's possible to try to make x86 code into something that you would run in a browser. Um, and native client did it, and WebAssembly is sort of the moral successor in many ways. But x86 code in itself, while it's fast, uh, it's kind of, well, maybe portable, multi-language, but not platform independent. But x86 itself is also unsafe, right? So if I give you an arbitrary x86 piece of code, it's 
going to be a little bit tricky for you to run it safely. You might have to start up a whole VM like Firecracker did, like we looked at last week, in order to isolate this arbitrary x86 code. And these browser guys don't want to be starting lots of VMs when you visit a web page. I think they're thinking that's probably too high overhead and also requires the operating system to support VMs that they don't want to require. This roughly makes sense as the context for this paper? Ask questions, or ask through, I guess Kevin is not here today, but uh, through Richard, you can ask the same anonymous questions as well, if you want. Um, all right, so one thing worth also discussing as sort of a preface for all this is, why, why are these guys against using OS or VM isolation, like what we talked about last week? We talked about all these ways that you could run containers or small VMs with things like Firecracker. Seems like a great plan. So why are they not excited? Why aren't they running processes or VMs? Yeah. Ah, okay. So you're saying, you know, you, I want to run this web page on, I want to view this web page on some device that the web developer might not have seen before. So that device might not have support for virtual machines, for that matter. Or maybe it doesn't have support for x86. Maybe it's an ARM device. So indeed, so one thing about OS and VM installation is it's sort of platform specific. So if we use things like user IDs, well, those are only on Linux. Windows has a different thing. Mac OS has something kind of user IDs. They have other things as well. Every operating system is a little bit different. So now the web browser wouldn't be so independent of the OS anymore, which would be kind of a weird thing to have. Your website would render differently, maybe, or run differently on different operating systems. That's sort of undesirable. Another problem with OS and VM isolation mechanism is they're kind of privileged. What I mean by this is that it's not the case that on every device you can just spin up a VM. If you're a root on Linux, then you can probably do it. But if you're not root on some other machine, well, maybe it won't let you spin up a VM, or at least not an efficient one. So, for instance, on Linux, you have to be root in order to use KVM, or you have to be in a special group. Um, so there, you might need the browser to have special permissions on your machine in order to use VMs. Same thing for containers. You have to be root to, to call setuid on Linux, something similar on Windows. So you might need, to, yeah, might need special privileges to use these isolation mechanisms so they're not as widely available. So, yeah. So as a result, the browser developers are thinking, that's going to put us in a pickle because we're going to be stuck on some machine where we can't spin up a VM because we're not running as root, and you shouldn't run as root. So that seems undesirable from their perspective. Another thing that they don't really talk about as much in the paper is overhead. So there's some overheads, uh, as we saw with Firecracker, in starting up these VMs, and you can probably start them up in you know, 100 milliseconds and so on. But they, they don't want to wait for 100 milliseconds to load every part of the web page. That adds up quickly. So performance is another consideration for them. So the alternative plan these guys are excited about is this thing I alluded to, sort of the big idea. is called software fault isolation, or SFI for short. So the plan is going to look quite different from hardware supported isolation that we saw earlier. So on one side, we have some application code that we want to compile and run. And this thing could be written in any language, like C or Rust or Go, whatever you want. And what's going to happen is we're going to put it into a compiler. And this compiler is going to be kind of SFI aware. It's going to be a special compiler that knows we're not just producing an x86 binary to run locally, we're going to produce a WebAssembly binary. And I should say, for example, Clang, pretty widely used C, Rust compilers, etc. they support uh, compiling to WebAssembly these days, so not a particularly esoteric thing these days, although it did require some work for the compiler developer. So they produce some kind of a binary. And then, in order to run this binary, there's not an extra step. So typically, you just compile the binary and run it. But here, we want to valid, we need to make sure this binary is a sensible thing to run. So well, there's going to be a validator of some sort that is going to take the binary and inspect it. And then we'll have a runtime and some kind of a system that's going to take this binary and execute it safely. 
And now we actually have executing code. So these two steps are separate because they're going to happen on two different machines or in two different contexts. Question. Oh, SFI aware, I was writing here. Yeah, sorry, but yeah, thanks. So these two phases are going to happen in two different contexts. So this on the left is going to happen on the developer machine. So the developer can take the code, whatever code they want, as far as I care, as far as the person writing the code, they don't actually care what co code you had, C or Rust or whatever, as long as you compile it to this binary of some form. And then this is going to happen on the running machine. So the machine that's going to run the program takes the binary and runs it through a validator. The validator and the runtime is going to make sure this thing is safe to run, but it doesn't actually care how it got compiled, and it's going to be able to execute it. So that's sort of the plan. And we're not going to rely on almost any hardware support in order to do this safely. We're just going to carefully validate the binary and carefully execute it, as we'll see. And uh, might actually achieve the goals of these guys. Make sense? So that's roughly the plan. Any questions? So I want to do a quick demo. This stuff is just like in every computer these days, so easy enough to see what it looks like. So here I have a piece of code that I wrote in C, a little library. I have a function add that adds two numbers. I have a function called foo that sort of flips the uppercase to lowercase letters and the string that you pass into it. So it like flip lowercase hello to uppercase hello. And it's just boring sort of C code. And I can actually compile this into WebAssembly and run it. So here I have a little driver, main.c. All it's going to do is call my foo function to flip the case of stuff. So I can just compile it with make, runs clang, and then I can run it, main.wasm, and I can pass it as some string. And uh, you can see, it like ran the code, takes that string, converts it, all good. And I can even run it in the browser. So here, I was able to run it on my command line using a tool that sort of is the right side of this diagram, but it's not super exciting because you can already do this by just compiling to a regular elf binary in Linux. But I can do this in, in the browser too. So here I have a web browser that loads that piece of code, and I wrote a little HTML front end for it. Pretty weak UI, but whatever. It runs, I can call, run, and it'll add two numbers. I can click run, and it'll run my WebAssembly code on this string. I can say something else, and it'll you know flip the case of that thing as well. So the cool thing is I'm able to call C code safely in my browser and interact with the whole page just as if it was a direct application, but, it's safe. So here's, let's, let's try to do something maybe unsafe. Um, actually, maybe before this, let me show you what this code looks like. Um, so here's lib.wasm. So this is just sort of the structure of this wasm file. It's got the imports. It's got a memory. It's exporting a couple of functions. This is sort of makes sense from the paper. You guys saw that you can export a function, etc. So I'm exporting add and foo and functions to allocate memory. And I can even look at the WASM binary contents itself. So I can uh, ah, WASM to what this library code. And uh, here are the WebAssembly instructions for my function. So here's the add function. It's got two i32 parameters, and it returns a 32-bit integer as well. And you know, here's the code. It's kind of inefficient because I didn't pass an optimization flag to Clang, but uh, you know, compiles to a whole bunch of WASM opcodes. And here's foo, this thing that flips case and strings. It also takes a 32-bit input, that's a pointer, and returns another 32-bit integer. It's also a pointer, happens to be. And then, you know, lots of code, calls other things like string length and other stuff. But notice that string length is just like totally an internal thing to this module. It gets inserted by the compiler, and it runs. As far as the browser is concerned, it doesn't care. There's no string length, just a whole module. It all runs together. So anyway, so that's a, what a WebAssembly thing looks like. We can edit the code and add this memset, just like tries to corrupt memory, writes a very large number of A's into the resulting buffer, which surely overflows it. So let's try to see what happens. So if I run make and try to execute it again, the runtime tells me at run, you know, I ran out of bounds. And you know, okay, well, this sort of looks like a seg fault maybe to you because it's the same thing you would have gotten if I had it natively. 
But here's the cool thing. I could load it in my browser, and I can click Run. Nothing happens. But if I look at the browser console, the browser tells me that it actually had an error during running this code, and it caught it. Now, it didn't actually corrupt the browser. I can actually still run other code. Like, I can still run the add function because I can, you know, the browser recovered from, auto, from the memory access problem. I can run another function just fine now. So hopefully this makes sense. This is sort of what it looks like. Yeah, question. So the thing, to, the way you should think of WebAssembly, it's kind of like x86. x86 doesn't have strings. x86 has bytes and 32-bit and 64-bit pointers that you can use and addresses. Strings are a thing you can build out of bytes in x86. And similarly in WebAssembly, you build strings out of bytes. And the basic WebAssembly types are just 32-bit things, 64-bit things, and also you can do one-byte things as well. Yeah, question. Ah, so that library, it's a little bit of a sort of a thing I didn't explain. The compiler, I configured the compiler to come with a WebAssembly version of a standard library inside of it. So when I compile my code, it injects for me an implementation of all the functions I used, Stradlan, malloc, free, inside of my WebAssembly module. The browser doesn't really know about them, but they are there so that I can call Stradlan, malloc, and all these things, string compare, two upper, two lower, etc. Question back there? Ah, the reason malloc is exported is because I gotta call it. In order to call it, I gotta allocate some memory for the string to pass in. So the caller needs to first call malloc and say, give me some bytes. Then I fill in those bytes, and then I pass it in as a pointer. Because the thing I can pass in, of course, is a 32-bit pointer. And to call foo on some string, the pointer has to point to some memory with the bytes I wanna pass in. Make sense? Question? Yeah. Okay, so an excellent question. If I take some unsafe code from C and compile it with Wasm, what happens? Well, you just saw this. This library code I just compiled is unsafe. It runs over past the end of the heap by memsetting. And what happens is that it turns into a trap, what the paper calls a trap. And basically, the runtime catches it while running the code, doesn't let it overwrite past the end of anything, and it reports an error, like the browser says, ah, I stopped it right when it went past the end of something. And, well, you deal with it now. But not, nothing got corrupted, which is the cool thing. Make sense? Other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry? Oh, if it was a small out-of-bounds error. Good question. So WebAssembly, in some sense, doesn't really care about corruption inside the box. Very much like if you remember baggy bounds checking, it didn't really care if you went out of bounds of the object itself. It only cared about allocation bounds. Same idea here at a much coarser granularity. The only thing that's going to get caught if, is if you go out of bounds of the whole WebAssembly module. If you corrupt something internally, that's the module's problem. As far as the browser is concerned, the only thing it's trying to enforce is that this module doesn't escape out. So you could totally have a buffer overflow of some sort inside of the WebAssembly module, and if you cared about what the WebAssembly module is doing, well, maybe it'll not do the right thing anymore, but it's not going to escape out and corrupt the browser. Good question, yeah. So the boundary is really the whole module. That's the only thing we're really enforcing. Good. Other questions about this? So we'll dive into the details, trying to understand how this all happens, but hopefully this gives you some, some, some sense of what WebAssembly is providing for us. All right. All right, so let's try to understand how this is going to work. So as we saw, uh, these WebAssembly files, or the binary, or the module, I guess, has a couple of parts to it, like the paper was saying. So the main thing there is we have a bunch of functions. These are the things you can actually invoke from a WebAssembly module, sort of the main thing for its existence in some sense. And then there's a couple of other pieces. There's a global variables. These correspond to probably global variables you would have had in your source program. So if I had a global variable in my C code, this would translate into a global variable in my WebAssembly module as well. Then there's tables. These are tables of function pointers, basically. These guys are used for indirect calls, which we'll get to later. 
And then we also have memories. You can actually just have one memory. And this is for the heap. So WebAssembly doesn't have everything living in memory. So in x86, if you think about it, everything in the world is in memory. There's nothing but memory, effectively. I guess there's a couple of registers, but that's tiny. Everything of interest is in memory. The code is in the memory. The stack is in the memory. All the heap allocations are in the memory. Everything is there. Global variables, of course, too. WebAssembly separates things out much more, much more structured. And that's actually, in some ways, makes it much easier to write one of these validators and runtimes because you know that the memory doesn't have any return addresses or function pointers, for example. That makes the validator's life much easier. And then on top of this, the things you can do is basically you can also import or export any of these things. So in the example above, we saw that the foo function and the add function was exported, so the browser can call it from the outside. You can also have imports that go the other way, where if the WebAssembly module wants access to some functionality, it can ask for it to be an import. And then when you try to run it, your job as a runtime is to supply that function or whatever it is that the module is asking for. And then you can allow the module to call a specific function out of the module. But that's the, sort of the boundary between the WebAssembly module and the rest of the world is through these imports and exports. Make sense? Questions? Okay. So what's hard about building this runtime or what's sort of what's going on in this validator? So the big challenge, as maybe you've already sort of caught on, is really getting isolation and performance at the same time. So the easy way to run a program in isolation is to just build some kind of an interpreter. So the interpreter is just going to run the code. So you can even think like something like QEMU. Right, so QEMU, not using KVM, I mean. It takes some code on top of it. could be written in x86, ARM, who knows. And QEMU is just going to interpret it effectively, looks at the instructions, and it runs them one at a time. It's a little bit more sophisticated than that, but roughly it's an interpreter. And almost by design, it's safe. Because if QMU is looking at this code, and it's looking at every instruction at a time, if an instruction asks to access some memory, QMU is going to access the emulated memory. It's not going to access its own memory. Like, you know, just write an interpreter. This is the same way that the JavaScript engine runs in the browser for the most part, or at least a simple version of a JavaScript engine, just interprets the JavaScript code. And there would be no confusion as to how it could possibly escape, as long as the emulator is, interpreter is correct. The problem is that although you can get isolation, it's slow. And the reason it's slow is that you're looking at the code, and for every instruction, you're deciding, oh, I'm going to do this, 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 this. You're interpreting it one step at a time. It's not going to be super fast. But it's safe. So that's sort of the trade-off. And in order to do faster, typically what you want to do is instead of interpreting, you really want to translate the code into native, maybe native instructions. So if I'm running on an x86 machine, I want to take the code that I want to run, like this application code, or maybe this WebAssembly binary, I want to translate it into some native instructions. And this is the thing that I'm going to run. I'm going to run the native instructions after I translated them once. And as long as my translation is reasonably efficient, like if I take one add instruction here, I translate it into one add instruction here, you know, a shift, all these logical operations, manipulating data, you know, string operations, they're all going to hopefully translate into a small number of native instructions, hopefully one to one. And it's going to run almost as fast as native. So that's the goal for these guys in terms of getting performance, is to enable this kind of translation. That you can take this application code, this would be WebAssembly in their case, translate into x86 or ARM, whatever your CPU is running, and then run that fast. Make sense? Yeah. Ah, good question, yeah, so like, yeah have some C code in my example. Um, I think almost any C code 
will work. I think uh, you might not be able to do some super low level things. Like, of course, you know, invoking a syscall is not a thing that's well defined in WebAssembly, so you wouldn't be able to do that. And you might not be able to also do low level control flow things like set jump and long jump. The, if you haven't heard of it, that's not a problem. You can ignore it, but sort of things that access the hardware machine state in C aren't really well defined in WebAssembly because you don't have hardware machine state in quite the same way. But any sort of well-behaved ANSI C or you know, C99 program, pretty much everything will compile to WebAssembly in Clang. So it's pretty broad and pretty widely supported. Question, yeah? Well, yeah, so that's really a question for the compiler. Inline assembly, so the reason I mentioned C99 is because C99 is sort of the portable standard for what C code is. Inline assembly is not in the C standard, and it's really part of the compiler. Now, it might be that Clang allows you to inject inline WASM as part of your code if you're compiling C to WASM. I don't know, but I could totally imagine that being a thing that you could support in a compiler, is to allow the application to inject arbitrary WASM calls if they care to. Uh, I'm not sure if any compiler exposes this, but wouldn't it be totally crazy to do that. Sense? Other questions? All right. So that's sort of the, the plan, is to somehow build this translator. The challenge, of course, right, is that we're just going to jump into the middle of some x86 code here. And <laughs> something better not break, or like better not corrupt our state, better not have any security problems in there. So we have to have a lot of faith in this translation step that somehow any code output by this translator is going to be fine to jump to. Well, that's a pretty big leap of faith, but sort of that's the kind of plan that WASM is going to provide for us. So what does this translation look like in WASM? So roughly speaking, the way WASM is going to work is, I think the, well, this paper talks about the WASM semantics and the definitions of it, but uh, you can sort of extrapolate or we'll discuss what a runtime might look like for WebAssembly based on what the paper describes. And roughly, you can imagine that you would take one basic block in WASM. So a basic block is a sort of a sequence of instructions without jumps in the middle of them. It's like all things you would run straight line, and then we'll jump somewhere at the end of the basic block. So you would take a basic block, and you would probably translate that into a native basic block. It's BB for basic block. And then we're going to stitch together all these basic blocks. And to sort of understand what we care about is really the safety profile. This is sort of the translate step, I should say. And we're going to translate each basic block and then somehow arrange for the control flow between these things to match up. But safety ends up being a property that we care about is generated code. So what does safety for this native code look like? Well, we probably care about two things. One is that any memory that this code accesses should be within the module boundary. So we need to worry about any memory access that is performed by this generated code. This is code that we're outputting, so we're sort of you know, producing this code at runtime or at validation time. And we need to make sure that any memory access operations that are going to be performed by our generated code better be safe. They can't go outside of the module boundaries. And we also have to make sure that any control flow between basic blocks also stays safe. So when a basic block stops and jumps to some other basic block, we can't leave the bounds of the module either. So that's sort of the property we want in this WebAssembly translation process. That sort of makes sense? We'll try to dive into details shortly. All right, so how are we gonna actually get the safety property for translation? So the plan is gonna be sort of twofold corresponding to these two goals. So for the first one is we're gonna actually generate code for each basic block. And the code that we're going to generate is going to ensure that we're going to access memory within the module. 
So if we need some check, we can actually generate code that will perform the check at runtime. So we'll generate code to check memory accesses. So we generate these checks in the code, and then when we run them, when we actually run the function, those checks are going to execute, and they're going to make sure that we're only accessing valid memory locations that belong to the module. And as you can imagine, for perf well, you can always add these checks, or we'll see how you add these checks, but the trick is going to be for performance, we want as few of these checks as possible. These checks are costly because they're runtime checks. These are pieces of code we're generating that are going to run when you execute the generated code. And if we have fewer of them, we're going to get closer to native performance. So as we'll see, the WebAssembly design is sort of geared towards making it possible to emit relatively few of these checks. And the other part of the plan for control flow is going to be to make sure that control flow only flows between these well-translated basic blocks. So, you know, think that control flow goes to other well-translated BBs. So that's roughly the plan. Once we go into one basic block, we know that all the memory access within it are good, and we know that all the places that it could jump at the end are going to be other basic blocks that are themselves only going to do safe memory access and only jump to other good places. That's roughly the plan. I'm hand-waving somewhat, but yeah. question? Yeah, so, okay, so one question is, well, why don't we just uh, assign some group of pages to each module and then let page faults deal with it? So I guess the question is, are you, are you planning to run this module with only those pages present being mapped in memory? If that's the case, then you're basically using OS process level isolation. But at that point, you've unmapped everything else from the process. You need some other kind of debug interface to monitor it. it sort of becomes a little VM that you're running. So that sort of describes what Firecracker does, for instance, right? The only pages mapped are the ones you can access inside the virtual machine. But it needs some hardware support for that to work. So you can trap out of the VM somewhere. And if, and if you don't have somewhere to trap out, you need to have code inside of that address space that's, that you're going to jump to to recover from a trap or to run the rest of the browser, for example. So that's really the challenge. And the reason that it's difficult to determine whether all these memory accesses are going to be safe at validation time I guess I should have said here, the challenge in this translator is really going to be computed memory addresses. So meaning that I am accessing a po data pointer instead of accessing location 5. And because I'm accessing a pointer, the pointer itself was computed by the program. And statically, I don't know what that value is. And same, computed function pointers are the same kind of a problem. We don't know where it's going to jump to. If we know it's calling some other function, strlen, then fine. Yes, strlen is fine to call. But if it's calling a function pointer that's going to be computed during the execution of the program, the validator doesn't know what it is. But it still has to emit some code that's going to jump somewhere. And that's going to be a one challenge here. Make sense? All right. Other questions about this? All right, so let's try to talk about how we're going to do this. I guess let's talk about first about managing stuff within a basic block. So within a basic block, we have a bunch of WebAssembly instructions, and our job is to figure out how do we generate x86 code, for example, that's going to faithfully execute those WebAssembly instructions, but also intersperse them with sufficient checks that they're not accessing stuff out of bounds, out of the module boundary. So in order to do this, we have to understand what is actually the stuff that's in bounds. What are the things that you are allowed to access? So what's all the state in a module? So what can a WebAssembly program legitimately access? What should we give it access to? Yeah? Okay, yeah, so we have the, the, the heap memory. 
Are there other things? So remember, in WebAssembly, right, it's not all memory, like x86, it's not a flat memory comprising everything. There's also other state that we've partitioned off into sort of disjoint chunks. And one thing, for example, that we already saw in the WASM module definition is that global variables are actually a separate thing in WebAssembly that are not part of the big memory, or the heap memory, I should say. And similarly, local variables are also a separate thing in WebAssembly that you access differently than the way you access global heap memory locations. And finally, WebAssembly has this notion of an operand stack. So the whole WebAssembly instruction set is defined as a little stack machine that uh, everything sort of pushes and pops off the stack all the time. The paper says that you, know, you could potentially optimize this away and use registers, and I think many runtimes would probably do this, but sometimes you might need to actually, if you run out of registers for these operand stack values, you might need to still store them somewhere in your implementation. So somewhere also there's these operand stack values that you might need to store in your implementation, and consequently the, the WebAssembly code can ask to reference, ask to, ask to ask access, I should say. Make sense? All right, so let's talk about how we're going to translate WebAssembly instructions that touch these different parts of state and how we're going to convince ourselves that the code we're generating is safe for that WebAssembly instruction. This makes sense? Is like what we're doing, what we're trying to construct here? Questions about the plan so far? Yeah. Ah, so uh, I guess the reason I don't include it in the state is because it's not a mutable state, so I don't, you know, there's read-only stuff, uh, like the WebAssembly code itself, for example, I'm also not mentioning here, mostly because it's not mutable, that you can't write to it. Um, so I, I don't worry so much about things that you are not able to modify. Although you should worry about, to some extent, things that you can read, but indeed, the, the read stuff ends up being slightly easier. Uh, yeah. I guess, yeah, I should have said mutable state maybe there, yeah. All right. So what's the plan for global variables? So if we have some WebAssembly instruction that is accessing a global variable, how do we decide if it's safe or not? Any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, so I guess in WebAssembly, what's the instruction for getting a global, right? So, for example, you could do a set global. Set global, and you just supply the index of the global. So, I don't know, maybe you can say set global 15. And there's no computed global address, you should note, here. And you have to say exactly which specific global variable you want right then and there. You're not allowed to compute, I want the ith global variable where I'll compute i at runtime. That's not a useful thing for many languages to compile to, so WebAssembly doesn't support it. The only way you can refer to a global variable is to specify the variable number right in the instruction. And as a result, you can actually decide statically at validation time whether this is fine, because the module has some known number of global variables. So we can just validate statically. And the question is basically, is 15 less than the number of globals? So this is one thing, for example, that the validator does, is checks that your references to global variable indexes are in bounds, but this can be done statically. That's cool. There's no computed global variable indexes. And the generated code that we're going to generate is, um, so, well, sort of depends where we keep the pointer to all the global variables at runtime. But imagine that our runtime, for example, reserves one of the CPU registers for referencing to the array of all global variables. Well, in that case, the set global 15 can just uh, translate into some kind of a move into, I don't know, EAX, that's a really important register maybe, or RAX, 
but if we happen to have reserved it for the pointer to the globals at all times, then we'll just, you know, plus 15. I guess this would be like 15 of our RAX or something. But that's the instruction you would compile it down to, and you know it's safe, because RAX is always going to be a pointer to the global array, and you know that 15 is within bounds, because you statically checked it. All right, so we, we know how to deal with global variables now. Hopefully it makes sense. Questions about this plan? So this is one, I guess I should say, one example where WebAssembly's design is really helping us make this validation process really efficient. So global variables are fixed size, all constant indexed. We can just do this. Same thing with local variables, in a sense. So local variables, also, there's a fixed number or no number of local variables for every function. So each function has a fixed number of local variables. And you can only reference a local variable with a constant offset or an index similar to global. So you can do a, you know, a set local 22, and that'll set the 22nd local variable. And similarly, during validation, the validator will check if all the constants of local variables in a particular function are within bounds of that function's number of local variables. That makes sense? So again, we can do this sort of static validation. And by static here, I mean that we can check it at validation time, and then we don't have to actually output any runtime check to know whether this is going to be safe or not. Question. Oh, okay. All right. Question here. So, that local uh -huh. like allocate memory? Ah, okay. So, so let me describe the semantics of this instruction. So, your question is like, well, what does this do? So, there's a operand stack in WebAssembly. So, at the time we're executing the set local opcode, something is already on the stack. So, maybe here you somehow manage to push 15 onto your stack. So set local 22 is going to now stick 15 into the local variable 22. Where this gets allocated, though, is earlier on. If you recall, when we looked at the example of the library in WebAssembly I compiled, at the beginning of the function, the function signature specifies the number of arguments it takes, the return value, and I have 25 local variables, for example. So the variable, the local variables of a function get allocated when the function starts running. So by the time the set local runs inside of a function, the function has already allocated the exact number of local variables it needs. And now you just check that 22 is less than, let's say, 25 that the function asked for. And then you're going to emit code to access the 22nd. If this was an access of 200, let's say, then you would check, ah, 200 is greater than 25 allocated. This is an invalid module. I'm not going to run this at all. So you'll refuse to do anything with this module. It's not translatable safely. Yeah, question. Okay, so your question is, uh, yeah, so suppose, suppose that we're Okay, so suppose it's a valid number. Maybe you actually have 200 variables, whatever. But you, instead of 15, it's some very large number. So anyway, what happens if you stick a really large number onto the stack? Well, there are sort of two answers. One is that there's only two types of things in WebAssembly. There's 32-bit things and 64-bit things. And you can't have anything larger than 64 bits. It'll just be two 64-bit things at that point. And... WebAssembly also tries to make sure that you don't confuse 32-bit and 64-bit things either, and it actually has types. So a thing I haven't mentioned yet is that every local variable is not just allocated to space, but you also specify whether each of these, let's say, 200 local variables are 32-bit or 64-bit, each one of them. And the validator knows that. So not only does it know there's 200 of them, and 200 is maybe okay, but for every one of them, it knows, oh, the first one is 32, the second is 32, the second one is 64 bits. And it knows whether the thing on the stack here that it was just pushed is 32 bits or 64 bits. So that also ensures that you never confuse 32-bit and 64-bit values either. 
So it's part of this type safety theorem. Yep, question? Ah, so your question is okay. So like in the WebAssembly code, we have the stack where we set local pop something off the stack. Do we have to also pop on the x86 side as well when we generate the code? And the answer is not really, not necessarily. As long as we faithfully simulate what this code intended to do, we're good. Now you could, of course, represent the operand stack from WebAssembly with the real stack in x86. But most runtimes turn out to do something else. They try to map the stack contents onto registers so that you don't have to keep pushing and popping all the time. It turns out to be faster. But it's totally a choice of the, implement of the runtime implementation, and either one would be fine, although omitting these native stack operations probably would be faster. Sense? Another question? Ah, so your question is, okay, so suppose you have a language, I don't know, that you were compiling from, like Rust, and Rust allowed you to create more local variables on the fly. Is that roughly what you're sort of trying to get at? So WebAssembly doesn't support this. So you wouldn't be able to allocate more local variables. Like I decide, okay, I, I'm going to start this function. I'll have two local variables to start with, and then I'll compute some number, and then I'll ask, well, give me X more local variables. Not possible. So the way you'd probably do this is that the compiler would probably have to take that funny source code and maybe call malloc to allocate that chunk of memory for your variables and then point into them. And some compilers do actually do this. I think Clang will actually do this for you. Uh, Clang actually understands how to invoke malloc on your behalf if you ask for something variable length that can't live on the stack, for instance. Depends on the exact compilation target, etc. but that's roughly how you would handle it. Other questions? Yeah. Ah, so your, your question is, okay, suppose we have multiple modules. So, so far, we've talked about just one module, but in fact, everything here, for simplicity, think of it as being belonging to one module at a time. So the global variables of one module belong to that. And the code in that module refers to its global variables. Another module has its own global variables, and its code refers to those indexes. And that's sort of the simplest way to think of it. Now, you could import and export these things if you wanted to. I don't think any serious, any real system does this. I think you could. And then the job would be that or you still have to specify how many global variables there are. You just say that, oh, I'm not providing them. Someone else should plug them in for me. But you still say how many you expect. So then the difference would be, the registrar at runtime that refers to your global variables might be the same for your module and some other module. So you guys can both refer to the same global variables if that's what you want by the import-export structure. But both modules would have agreed ahead of time that they all think there's 20 global variables. And then all these checks are fine. So it sort of separates the definition of how, what the sizes and types are from who exactly provides it through imports and exports. So that lets you mix and match in some sense. Other questions? All right. So we've talked about global local variables. So that's like half the state. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Memory is going to be the hardest, of course. Um, but one thing that I sort of glossed over for this local variable is where do we actually find the pointer to the local variables? Because they're in the global variable case, it's always the same global variable pointer. In the local variable case, these are normally you would think of these as things living in your stack. So where do you find your local variables at runtime? So let's try to understand how we're going to implement the WebAssembly call stack and sort of reflect it in our native implementation. All right, so let's talk about the call stack. So on the WebAssembly side, so I guess I should say, with this whole translation plan, at all times, you're basically thinking in two worlds. One is the WebAssembly world and what's going on there. And how do you sort of correspond that WebAssembly world to an implementation world? So they all sort of continue executing in lockstep, in a sense. So in the WebAssembly world, suppose that we 
do something like call a function f. Well, what happens when you call f? We are going to create a set of local variables for f. So f's locals are going to appear somewhere in the call stack on the WebAssembly. This is the logical side. Here's how WebAssembly thinks of the world running. You allocate the local variables for f because you called it. And you create an operand stack. And, you know, f starts running, keeps pushing stuff on the operand stack, and so on. At some point, maybe f decides to call g. Well, at that point, we're going to create g's local variables. And we're going to continue pushing stuff on the operand stack for g. This might be stuff that f pushed. Here's stuff that g pushed. We can also, I guess, call back to f. And then, sort of recursively, here's going to be another copy of f's local variables for the second invocation. These are separate local variables because each set of local variables belongs to a particular call invocation. And then, you know, more stuff on the operand stack for f. So the question is, what does this all look like in the x86 or native world? So on a native machine, like where we translate this execution into, both of these things are going to live on the stack. Because the stack is a good way to have scoped state for every invocation of every function, even if it's recursive. So the way this is going to look like is probably on our native stack, we're going to start out, and then when we first call f, we're probably going to push some return address onto the stack, because we need to know where to return once f finishes running. So we'll have the return address for f on the stack, and then on the stack also, we'll have f's local variables, and then here we'll have the operands for f. If, you know, f keeps pushing and popping, we can push and pop on the real stack as well if we don't optimize it away. And then when f calls g, we'll save the return address into f on the stack and then have g's state. So we'll have g's locals and then, you know, more operands down here. So just to give you some sense, right, this is the stack frame for f. And this down here, this is G's stack frame. Make sense? So that's what the implementation is probably going to look like for running this WebAssembly code. So we're going to interleave a bunch of things on the real native stack. We're going to have the local variables on the native stack. We're going to have the operands on the native stack. And we'll actually even have the return addresses on the native stack as well. These are the real x86 return addresses for, for our basic blocks to keep chaining to each other. Does this make sense? Question. Yeah, so good question. What prevents you from overflowing a buffer? So, yeah, there's a return address. Why don't you overflow the local and go up to the return address? So why can't you do this? What's going to catch you? Yeah? Sorry? Yeah, so the validator, basically this check. Like, the, when you do a set local to some address, the validator is going to check that it's less than the number of local variables you ask for. And if you try to store to a local address that's larger than the number of local variables you asked for, the validator is going to say no. It's not even going to bother writing your module. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So, like, part of the function definition, that's what we were talking about, is every function has a fixed number of local variables. Right in the function signature, when you define a function as part of the module, you're going to say, here, you know, one of the functions is foo. It has, you know, five local variables, let's say. And, by the way, they have type i32, i64, i64, and then some other types. You totally just define how many local variables you will ever have, and their types. That's what's going to live on the stack. And statically, you're going to validate every access to a local variable. And you're going to make sure that the only modules that pass validation are the ones that access local variables in this safe manner. Make sense? Yeah. Other questions? So this is a pretty cool property, right? So like already we're you know, defending against something here. So I guess one thing that we were trying to figure out is 
how would we actually know where to pull, like, how do we get access to the base of the local variable? So for globals, we know. We can just, like, maintain one of the CPU registers as always pointing to the start of all the global variables. What do we do for locals? Because at any given time, like, our stack pointer is probably at the bottom of our operand stack right now. Like, we're running in the middle of G. That's where we are. How do we get access to G's locals, for example, if you want to access a local variable inside of the G function? Yeah, question? Oh. You're good? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, you can't allocate a new stack in the sense that the, the G's are already here. You have to find them. So the question is, if you have an instruction like set local 22 or set local 200, what x86 code do you translate it to so that it finds where those locals are? So for, for globals, we suppose that we reserve the CPU register for it. But here, RSP is some, I don't know, it could be like 100 bytes down, could be 200 bytes down from it. How do we know how far up to look? Any guesses? Yeah? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so, okay, so maybe what you're getting to, sorry for the mix up, <laughs> yeah, too far of a distance. Um, so one thing that's going on is that in fact, this is where the type safety of the, app, of the code comes in. And in particular, we know the depth of the operand stack at every given point. So let me just try it out what this plan is for understanding stack locations. I'm sorry? I will try. It's to some extent hopeless, but I'll try. Yeah. Stack locations. Um, so one possibility, there's lecture notes too. You can check them out online. They're ASCII, universally readable. I think it's going to be tough then, man. All right. Uh, so stack locations, how are we going to deal with uh, trying to figure out where the variables are in our stack. Well, the type safety theorem for the WebAssembly thing, it's these two giant tables. I sort of apologize for them. This is a paper meant for a PL audience, which this class is not a PL class. So I'm not going to quiz you on the contents of those tables. But what they're trying to achieve is to tell you that the program is going to manipulate the stack in a way that preserves the types of all the operands on the stack at any given time. And in particular, a really cool property that this type safety theorem tells us is that we actually have a known stack depth at every instruction. Regardless of how we manage to get there. One second. Regardless of how we got there. I'll get to you in a second. One second. So the point is that you can look at some piece of WebAssembly code. You could have a function with hundreds of WebAssembly instructions. And one of them is, let's say, one of these set local instructions. It's the middle of the code. The type safety theorem tells you that you can, in the validator, know what's going to be on the stack at exactly that instruction. And the reason this is non-trivial is because there might be multiple control flow paths that get you to that instruction. You might branch, and on different branches you might do different things. But the stack consistency theorem, or the sort of type safety theorem, tells you that if you ever branch back and connect at the same opcode in the WebAssembly instructions, you will necessarily have the same number of things on your stack, and they'll have the same type. And what this means is that you don't actually have to worry about all the ways that you get from the entry of the function to this one instruction. You can just look at the type signature of that instruction and convince yourself that it has a certain number of stack locations expected at runtime. That makes sense? So the cool thing is that we might look then at the set local instruction 
And during validation, we might decide that stack depth for the operand stack here is, let's say, 70, just making up some number. So if we know that the stack depth is 70 for that instruction, we can generate code that accesses RSP plus 70, or maybe 70 times the size of a stack location, for example. And we know that at that instruction, RSP plus 70 will necessarily point to the beginning of the local variables of the stack, because we know there will always be 70 stack locations, uh, sorry, 70 elements on this operand stack at the time that instruction runs. That make sense? Questions about this? All right. Yeah, question. Yeah, you don't have to be here, man. No, I mean, I have to, though, because I want to be done. All right, then you have to. Well, you could write a web application that has high performance. Uh, well, that particular thing, no. All right. Okay, so let's try to figure out or how we're going to manage safety for other state accesses. So we've looked at global variables here and local variables. And for these, because of type safety, we can actually elide all of the bounds checks and generate code that will access locations at sort of well-defined offsets without slowing down the actual runtime execution. Make sense? And same for the operand stack. If we ever have sort of logical operand pushes and pops, we can uh, pop off the values of the operand stack. And uh, we know that due to the type safety theorem, if there's ever a pop, we know that there was a value on the stack available for us to pop, otherwise this program wouldn't have type checked. So it's safe to generate an x86 pop corresponding to a WASM pop. All right, so let's talk about memory. So that's the most annoying part of this in some ways. So how do we actually get safety for memory accesses in WebAssembly? So let's erase this board up here. All right, so memory accesses. All right, so imagine that in the source code we have some operation like a of 10 equals 20. The way this is gonna compile down to WebAssembly is that we're gonna probably end up somehow pushing the address of the array itself onto the stack. Then we're gonna push the value that we wanna store. So this might be, I guess, i64.const20. And then we'll execute a store instruction. So the way this looks in WebAssembly is you'd say i64.store offset of, I guess, 10 times 8 is 80. So like 80 bytes, because this is a 64-bit array. Each element is 8 bytes long, so 10 offset is 80 bytes into it. That's the WebAssembly sequence that the compiler is going to generate for this C statement if you're trying to compile it. Make sense? So then the question is, how are we going to generate safe native code for these WebAssembly instructions? So what we want to do at some level is to access the memory location at this A address plus the offset specified by the instruction. So this offset is going to be 80. And here we're going to store the I guess the value 20 that we're gonna put there. I'm being maybe slightly sloppy with 64 bits versus eight bits, but hopefully this makes some sense. So what check would we need to perform in order to decide if this store is gonna be safe to perform, to execute? 
Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. So in this case, what would we have to check? Yeah. So something like probably, you know, if the offset we're accessing, which is A plus offset plus the size of the value we're storing happens to be greater or equal to mem size, then we're going to trap. So that's roughly the plan. So you could, like as a safe plan, you could generate x86 code that prefaces every memory load and store with an if statement like this. That's sort of, you know, not actually x86 code, but you can imagine like the equivalent x86 instructions to these operations. You could actually perform this check. And of course, the reason for checking the aid is that you don't, don't actually care about checking just the start of the offset where you're going to store, but all the bytes into which you're going to store as well at that offset. Question? Uh, how do you determine the mem size again? So how do you determine mem size? Yeah, that's a good question. So this is part of the runtime. So the runtime is going to maintain this memory array, and it's going to maintain the memory size. When the program starts running, it will initialize the memory array to a bunch of zeros of the size specified in the module declaration. So if your module is compiled and says, I want two pages of memory initially, you'll get a mem size equal to two pages and filled with zeros, or maybe you can have initial contents as well. And then the runtime will maintain this over time. The only operation you're allowed is that you can grow this memory. So there's a special opcode to allocate more bytes, only goes forward. And you can basically extend mem size as you want, and then you'll have more memory. So that's the implementation of malloc under the covers, as it calls grow memory. Make sense? Question? All right, let's talk after the lecture. Yeah, question? So yeah, in general, right, you could insert this check dynamically. And for some runtime implementations, this might indeed be a check you would want to insert, um, if, depending on your hardware availability. So we'll talk in a second about how you optimize. This is like, OK, this is going to be super expensive or noticeably expensive. And it would be cool if we can optimize this away. And it turns out that there are some tricks that the paper suggests that you can play to get rid of these checks. But in the general case, you could insert them and make this work with absolutely no hardware assistance or support whatsoever. Make sense? All right. So are you guys convinced this is going to give us safe memory accesses? Sounds good. Anyone else? Yeah. All right. Should be good. So indeed, not a trick question. Uh, so this is indeed a reasonably safe plan. Uh, so both for stores and loads, we can have the runtime insert these checks into the basic blocks that it produces here. And then the subsequent memory accesses are going to be safe because we know that we just checked that the offset we're accessing is within bounds, no overflow possible. So this is exactly the check that trips up in the example that I showed earlier, where I had this giant mem set in my piece of code I was compiling. It caused my code to do stores into large offsets that went way beyond mem size. And this check would trip up and get the browser to stop running my code before it had a chance to corrupt any memory. Good to go? Make sense? Questions? Yeah? Okay, so, so yeah, what, what does mem size include and how does it protect from various overflows? Mem size, actually, I should point out, Mem size only talks about the heap memory, so this thing. And in WebAssembly, heap memory is a disjoint thing from local variables and operand stacks and global variables. So you can actually have a WebAssembly program with zero mem size. And you can still run. You'll have your local stack, your operands, your global variables. As long as you never need to call malloc, you'll be good. So this memory in WebAssembly is something a little bit different than memory in hardware. Memory in WebAssembly is just a part of the memory you would normally think of. And in particular, the memory in WebAssembly is unstructured. It has no interesting pointers that are worth corrupting effectively. Whereas 
other state, like your stack, has interesting pointers, but it's well-structured. It's always constant offsets, so you don't get a chance to corrupt it. That's one way you can sort of think of it. Make sense? Other questions? Yeah? Ah, good question, yeah. So what stops you from putting a function pointer in memory? Well, depends a little bit about how we implement function pointers. So let's talk about that next. So how do we get control flow integrity? So it's like second part. We talked a little bit about memory safety. How do we get control flow integrity? The plan for that is basically to rely on those tables in the WebAssembly module definition. So what does control flow integrity look like? So there's two kinds of calls, just to sort of back up a little bit from your question. So you can have direct calls. And those are where the opcode in WebAssembly directly specifies, I want to call function 5. And there's nothing terribly exciting there, right? You just say call 5. And the compiler can statically check that this is going to be a call to function 5. Function 5 takes so many arguments, put them on the stack, all this good stuff, yeah. The trickier case is indirect calls. So the C pre-image, so to say, right, is like you have some, you know, star PTR of some arguments. This is the C code. This would get call. It's translated into... I forget the opcode in WebAssembly, uh, call indirect. So here, we need to have some representational function pointer in order to be able to invoke it. And of course, this function pointer could be totally under control of the WebAssembly program itself. So we have no idea if it's a valid function pointer. So the way WebAssembly works is that the thing you supply to call indirect is actually an index into this table. If you remember, the WebAssembly module had a table of function pointers. So you just list, or the compiler lists all the things that could ever be the target of a function pointer, and you stick them in this table. And they all be, must be valid WebAssembly function pointers for that module. And then the only thing that you have to check at runtime is the argument to call indirect is within the bounds of this table. And as long as it's within the bounds of the table, you can then, at runtime, go fetch that element of the table and then jump to the translated basic block for the start of that function. And then it's known to be safe because you translated, you've checked all these entries, they're all good functions. Make sense? Well, sort of, okay, so, so yeah, the, the, you were saying, okay, maybe the answer is the compiler is stopping you. Sort of yes and no. One thing to keep in mind is that in this WebAssembly world, the compiler is not trusted. So the compiler produces this table, and it's really this, the structure the compiler produces is amenable to efficient validation on the browser side to check that, indeed, you're calling one of these legit function pointers. You could totally bypass the compiler and inject a call to a non-existent table entry or have garbage in this table, but those things are all easy to check. So just to be clear, the translation of a call indirect opcode from WebAssembly is going to be a comparison to check that the offset into the table you're trying to jump to is within bounds of the table, followed by load that element and jump there. Make sense? Question. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, call five. Yeah, here it's like fifth function in the module. Yeah, here you could actually have the string foo or something. You can effectively think of it as that way. They encode it as integers for smaller space, but it's as, as if you were just calling the string, the function name foo right there. And he, an indirect is like actually, yeah, a pointer, and the representation, the integer here, is an integer into this table. And you can compute this thing at com runtime. This thing is statically in the WebAssembly code right then and there in the file. Make sense? Other questions? All right. So let me talk about the 
one trick they talk about in the paper for getting high performance memory accesses, meaning how do we get rid of those bounds checks here? I should say, this is almost the only bounds check that we are left with. Locals and globals and operand stack things don't actually need us to generate any runtime check code. This is the only thing left. And they have this fairly nice trick. If you can use a little bit of operating system and hardware support, then you can get rid of those checks as well. So the idea here is to map a large region of virtual addresses that covers all the possible offsets you could ever access. So here's your virtual address space in your runtime process. We're going to alloc allocate, so this is mem, I should say. This is the base of your heap memory in your WebAssembly module. And here's the heap memory. Only a little bit might be allocated. The rest of it is just unmapped. So there's nothing mapped at these virtual addresses. But the whole thing is going to be 8 gigabytes in size. So then, the cool thing about this structure, the reason this works out super well, is that the way you access any memory in WebAssembly, either stores or loads, is that you push an address onto the stack. This is the base address of the memory you want. And then in the instruction itself, you specify an offset. The reason there's this sort of duality is that often in your application code, you will want to access some variable, like A, and then you might have an offset for it, like the 10th element. And you want to efficiently encode this without having an add instruction in your WebAssembly instruction stream. So this means that for that WebAssembly instruction in the general case, we're going to be doing an access like memory of A plus offset. And both of these things in the WebAssembly spec are 32-bit values. So if we know that both these are limited to 32-bit values, we know that the largest they could possibly be is 8 gigabytes, 4 gigabytes each. So if we have this virtual memory structure in our runtime, then we can perform this, we can generate this code and run it at runtime safely, because regardless of what the WebAssembly code supplied for offset and the address, this is going to be safe. Either it's going to access the real heap memory, or it'll go past the end of the heap memory, and it'll access some unmapped address here, and then the operating system plus hardware is going to trigger a page fault and effectively segfold the process. And then we can catch the segfold and turn it into the error message that you guys saw in the browser. That makes sense? So this is the efficient way that I think most WebAssembly runtimes actually do this, because this means that memory operations translate into memory operations, like one-to-one. -one. Super efficient. Make sense? Questions? Yeah. Oh, over here? Oh, yeah, so here, I, th this line, you're having trouble reading? Yeah, this is if address A, this address A, plus offset, this offset 80, is greater plus 8, the size of the 64-bit value you're storing, greater or equal to mem size, the size of the memory, then trap. Oh, yeah, so, so trap is basically like produce that error message you saw in the browser. And then the page fold handler here would also do the same thing, trigger the same kind of a trap. Questions? Yeah? So your, your question is, okay, do you validate the whole program at once, translate the whole program at once, et cetera? So my understanding is that pretty much every WebAssembly runtime will validate the whole program up front, but it doesn't necessarily translate it all into native code up front. So validation is that giant table of rule typing rules in the paper. It basically checks that all the local variable offsets are in bounds, the global variable offsets are in bounds, that kind of stuff, that your operand stack is consistent. And then there's a separate step of generating this code. You can generate it up front. You can do a JIT translation, lots of options. Depends on what you're trying to do. Make sense? Question back there. Ah, okay, so your question is, okay, I, I want to do something big. Well, it turns out, yeah, so as you saw, this WebAssembly paper was written with the goal of trying to show a minimal working case. There's been a bunch of extensions to WebAssembly since it's been published. 
Uh, 64-bit addresses is one thing in flight. Threads is another thing. Vector instructions, it's all quite actively under development. I should say it's used in the browser, as you guys saw. Pretty much every browser has it now. Adobe Photoshop actually uses it in the browser if you run their web app. It's in WebAssembly. It's actually also used on the server side, somewhat surprisingly. So the paper for Thursday is about one use of it for non-web code. But uh, actually, Cloudflare and Fastly, these are like big CDNs, actually use it for their equivalent of Lambdas. So we saw the Firecracker, Amazon does Lambdas with VMs. These other CDNs actually use WebAssembly for their Lambda equivalent because this starts like another two orders of magnitude faster than Firecracker does. Like you can start a WebAssembly thing in a millisecond instead of 100 milliseconds. So some trade-offs, you can take arbitrary Linux code and run it here, but for some cases, way faster. Make sense? All right, so that's software fault isolation. We'll talk about how to actually design interfaces on Thursday's lecture. See you guys then. Hey, yeah. So this check right here, the the yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. That mem size is different from the eight gigabyte. Yeah. So that mem size. What I meant by that mem size is this mem size, like how much you've actually allocated. So if you have that check, you don't need the rest of this crap, yeah. because yeah. So exactly. So the. Or do this. So this is what everyone does for performance. So if you do this, you don't need that check at all. So this is still like one module. Yeah, so every module gets an 8 gigabyte chunk of virtual memory. And then for that module, it can only either crap on the unmapped stuff or access its legit stuff. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, so you can totally have pointers. Yeah, exactly. That's why it's actually a little bit tricky to decide whether these accesses are valid. So this, uh, for example, the address A could totally be a pointer that you've computed in the application. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's, it's basically like mimicking like a real memory. Yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. So it's trying to represent a real memory there. But... Uh,